Let's get into it. This is a joint effort between Lockheed Martin and General Motors. It just got announced. It's going to be a part of NASA's Artemis mission. It's back on the moon. We're going back. It's going to be great, better than ever before. But let's take a little bit of like a history lesson. Let's talk about the OG moon rovers. Um, I didn't know a whole lot about it, but I'm happy we're covering this because I learned quite a bit. So Yeah, L- let me know what's up with these because I don't know much about them either. So at first, the partnership seemed weird to me. Like, why would you have GM taking part in this? But apparently, the first iteration was built by Boeing and GM. Okay. So, so they already had like a first go at this. GM developed the like the wheels. They developed the chassis, the suspension, the motors. And you had Boeing taking over the electronic system and navigation system. Um, it was completely composed of an aluminum frame. It had non-chargeable batteries. So that means if you were out of charge, you were out of charge. But you had a total of 57 miles of range on the vehicle. So not bad at all. Um, it had a max speed of 8 miles per hour, but I forgot the name of the astronaut. There was one astronaut that actually hit 11 miles per hour. Um, so he holds the record for the uh, fastest travel on a lunar surface. Nice. Um, Need Eugene, for speed. Yeah, Eugene something. I don't remember right now. I, I, I should have wrote it down. Um, it had a max payload of 1,080 pounds, and it could hold two astronauts as it... Uh, moved around so this is the part that i thought was really cool that i didn't know about the operation of the lunar rover was limited so that it would always be in range of the lunar landing module so that if it ever broke down the astronauts could just walk back without like you know risking their lives okay yeah Um, so it it can go 57 miles but (laughs) it can't go 57 miles away from the lunar landing module. yeah like if you want to max it out you can just do circles around it really okay yeah. Um, from an engineer's perspective, this thing was built in 17 months. So that's like concept to final product in 17 months. That's insane. And it was used in the Apollo 15, 16, and 17 missions. Each of them had one lunar rover that went in with them, never came back, and they never had any major issues with it. So like okay. that is so wild to They me, ended dude. up making three different one of these LRVs, mm-hmm. and they went in with they, – they went up for each of those – Apollo missions Mm -hmm. and none of them failed and none of them failed and dude did that like you've worked on projects I worked on projects in 17 months like under two years you made something that was so good in an environment that you knew so little about and what like 1971 that's incredible coming in as a like project manager project engineer to an automotive company like in a few months this is something that I would not want to sign up for 17 months that seems like (laughs) such a headache it's like that is one of the most incredible feats of engineering of this whole thing. Agreed. Agreed. So it, it's already got this cool history for the Lunar Rover, but let's talk about what the 2.0 iteration is going to look like for the Artemis mission. So background on Artemis mission, like I said, we're going back to the moon. The idea is that we can explore more this time around. We've advanced more than last time, and we should be able to set up bases on the moon for further space exploration and whatnot. So do Lockheed and GM have a NASA contract for this? They they do. Speculatively, okay, so they're not speculatively Mm -hmm. making a lunar rover hoping that NASA buys it. No, NASA, from what I read, they put up like the bat signal. They're like, hey, industry, this is what we want. And then it came down to Lockheed and GM. So they've already got the bag. Yeah, they they already got the bag, yeah. Um, But yeah, what I was saying is that they they want to set up a base uh, on the moon. So mobility is definitely going to be an important aspect of it. So let's talk about what NASA wanted as the minimum requirements for this thing. They wanted this iteration to be internally and externally chargeable. What that means internally is that the device should have like solar panels or something that opens up so that you can recharge the batteries. And what they mean by externally is that whatever infrastructure they set up on the moon they want to be able to plug in the car to it and charge up the car. Like like with your okay. Tesla or I don't so know. Any it something. can charge itself and it can also be plugged into charge from something else. Exactly. Exactly. Um, just like before, they want to have at least two passengers and they want to be able to haul around 1,102 pounds for at least 1.2 miles. And they want to be able to operate this thing in the temperature range of negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit to 260 degrees Fahrenheit. That's like positive. Um. Using those things, uh, Lockheed and GM are going to collaborate and come up with something new. We don't really know a whole lot about it. We, we just kind of got like a teaser that this partnership's happening and something's coming. But based on the information that I could gather, these are there's like three key points that they're trying to address with this new lunar rover. 
main one being autonomous navigation. So GM is big on the autonomous space. They have, I think, Cruise is yeah, there. Cruise. Yeah. Cruise is really big for them. And they want to implement the system so that whenever astronauts are traversing through the lunar surface, they don't hit the hazardous uh, craters and holes and things like that and injure themselves. They want to well, be able to autonomously get around that. One thing that's interesting about Cruise is they don't have all their eggs in one basket in terms of like only using computer vision. They also have acquired some LiDAR companies, which makes sense because like some, some companies like Tesla, they're all in on computer vision. But when you need to train your autonomous driving in a visual context, like you'd have to replicate a surface of the moon to get these visual cues to train the system. So like they could use the one that for the fake lunar, fake lunar. That's what I was going to say. That stage. Yeah. (laughs) Go back, Um, go to LA and just use the stage, you know? Yeah. Use the stage that they did the fake lunar landing on. Um, But they can actually just rely on the LIDAR, which is another part of like Cruise's bread and butter. They own a LIDAR company because you can use that to identify objects and move around them, you know, stay away from craters. You can do all that without having to replicate the moon's surface. You can program that in using LIDAR. So that's exciting. And I'm happy you brought that up because when I was first reading the article, that was like my main source of hesitation. I'm like, well, computer vision models usually need something, some context clues to navigate. Yeah, and there's no stop signs. Yeah, there's no stop signs. There's no markings no, no on the lanes. road. No lanes. Yeah. Literally nothing. But LiDAR makes the most amount of sense. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's a big point for them. Uh, rechargeability, again, they want to be able to have a battery that lasts more than 57 miles if you're going to be like living on the moon. And then material selection. I think based on the articles, I, I think this is where Lockheed's expertise is really going to come into play. They might try to use different alloys, maybe composites or something that's you know lighter and stronger than the aluminum they used back in the day. Uh, more resistant to the environments, the harsh environments of the lunar surface. And since these things are not just going to be used for one mission and then left alone, they're going to be used, used over and over again. They probably want it to be more durable as well. Yeah, this seems like a really interesting and exciting feat of engineering. Um, hopefully they can live up to the legacy of the first lunar landers. Or Fingers lunar crossed. Because those are awesome. But, I mean, just being able, specifically just even the battery, being able to withstand those temperatures from minus 280 to plus 260 That's Fahrenheit and still be able to handle multiple charges and hold the power, it's going to be really exciting. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing what Lockheed and GM can pull out of their sleeve with this one.